Welcome to the pro program, Jawad. Looking forward to chatting today. Thanks for having me, Simon. I always like to, uh, to start the, the questions for my CFOs with what are the key things you look for in your direct reports when you're hiring? Yeah, you know, it's a lot of the traits I talk about in my book, but there are four uncoachable traits that I really look for when I'm hiring people. I share this with my team uh, when I, anytime I get to a job and have a new team that I inherit. The four traits for me are someone who has a very strong sense of integrity, strong sense of accountability, someone who's a team player, they're very collaborative. And then finally, someone who's got a very positive disposition. And that last one is very important. I catch some flack for that because some people tell me, well, I'm a realist, I'm not an optimist, but I really believe that the spectrum of, of optimism and, and you know negativity really comes to a point. And it, people tend to roll one way or another. And that's important when your team faces adversity. I like people who are generally positive because when they face adversity, they will, uh, you know, they'll roll up their sleeves and they'll, and they'll look at the opportunity ahead and they'll look at the challenge as a way to grow and an opportunity to grow versus people that trend the other way. They're the first ones that tend to gripe, right? And, and maybe uh, blame others or, or point fingers and that becomes toxic for your culture. So those four traits, there are questions that I ask in every single interview. I ask people, tell me about a time you had your integrity challenged and you know, tell me about something you took ownership over. So those are, those are the key things I look for. So from your perspective then, are softer skills more your focus or subject matter expertise when you're hiring direct reports? Yeah, great question. I interview almost exclusively for softer skills. I've assumed that at this you know, at the point someone makes their way to me in the interview process, that someone else has already interviewed them and, and really tested them on the, on the technical skills. Now, just to put some more context around that. So I own at Axon our finance, IT, legal functions. I also own our consumer business. So I've got a pretty big organization. No one can get hired into my organization unless they're, um, you know, their final interview is basically with me. I'm the, I'm the final person on the interview loop. And, you know, the things that I look for, um, again, at that point, I've assumed that if you made it to me, that someone else really screened for the technical skills. If it's a direct report to me, I will spend a little bit of time going deeper on technical skills, but generally the folks reporting to me are, are pretty senior and pretty well established. Uh, the softer skills are really what I, I look at. And it's not just when I hire, but also when I'm uh, managing a team, because I believe that maintaining your team and uh, really developing your talent that you have is just as important as making sure that you hire great talent. And so I also, I probably, Simon, spend two thirds of my time on people related matters. And what about for treasury then, Jay One? Is, is that something that you look at differently or is, is it the same when you're hiring into treasury as well? You know, for roles like treasury and tax, those are ones where I, I do dig a little bit deeper because those are those are very those are fairly specialized skills and they're uh, to me th those professionals are uh, I'm fascinated by them because you not only need to have that technical skill set it's a very it's a, you know those are both challenging treasury tax some of these more uh, technical roles are are challenging but then I also look for someone who's a team player and who also has all these softer skills. And those folks tend to be pretty exceptional when they've got obviously the intellectual horsepower to be able to have mastery over something like treasury as complicated as treasury, but then they also have the ability to be a team player and fit in. And I've learned this the hard way. Like, you know, we um, in the past have had folks in treasury that had the technical chops, but weren't necessarily team players or weren't really good at communicating and it was really difficult to drive alignment there, especially with the broader objectives of the company. Axon doesn't have any debt and uh, our company pretty much bootstrapped its way to growth. Our founder and, um, and CEO, you know, he founded the company and he's still here as the CEO of the company. And he never took any debt. He took a loan from his parents when he first started the company and since then has not taken on any debt. It's been a pride for him. And uh, I also personally have a bit of an aversion to it. I came from a private equity uh, role and those situations are very highly leveraged and just you know that overhang of the debt and all the acquisitions you do and just you know adding more debt to it, it it can be a bit restrictive in a way and it's very freeing it's been very freeing for me being at Axon uh, having 
very strong cash flow and not having to worry about, you know, the debt overhang. And so that also changes some of our approach from a treasury standpoint in like in, in how we want to invest our capital. And when you can't reach alignment with your treasurer, um, you know, that, that's a bit of a challenge. And so we've got someone now in the role who's fantastic, very much a team player. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, I'd say what's a little, a little different about treasury to answer your question, Simon, is that you've got to have someone that has both the technical chops, but also has the rest of those skills that I look for. And, and I think that's one of the things that comes up a lot talking to treasurers is the fact that, that, that business partnering and working with the business um, is such a fundamental part of treasury nowadays. I, I totally agree with you. I think if you're not getting that, there's not much point having a, a treasury fight. That's exactly right. Yeah, to give you an example, the previous treasurer we had, you know, would periodically float uh, various debt instruments or, you know, just different ideas around how we could raise additional capital without really understanding why we, we needed it or why now is a good time to do it. It was, it seemed like they were more interested um, in, in solving a problem or answering a question that no one asked. And our current treasurer really understands, well, I, I, I know the, the overall uh, growth of the company, like where we're headed, what markets we want to grow in. And, you know, he plugs in with our M&A pipeline. He knows where we're making investments potentially, or if there are acquisition targets in the pipeline, we've entertained the idea of potentially uh, investing in Bitcoin. And he's, um, you know, talked about what changes we need to make our investment, um, uh, our investment policy, you know, and so very forward thinking. I, I think you're absolutely right. Just having someone who's, who's a thought leader is critical in this role. How do you see the role of the treasurer changing in the future? I think you're going to see more of that shift towards strategic leadership where you, the, the technical ability is table stakes. You see this a lot with CFO roles as well. You have to be able to do, um, you know, technically you have to be able to do the job. Now I'm not a CPA. I never worked on wall street, but I've had enough experience over the course of my career where I know enough to be dangerous, you know, in those areas from a, you know, an, an audit standpoint, from a controllership standpoint, capital structures, capital allocation, et cetera. Um, you know, but for me, like where the value, the value that I bring to Rick and to the rest of the executive team is from a thought leadership standpoint. And it's the same thing. I would extend that to the treasurer as well. And you're going to see that, you know, you're going to see that trend. Too. Definitely. And what about from a technology perspective, technology is changing so rapidly. How do you see the role of the, the treasurer and I guess finance generally changing moving forward? This, this is so critical. Our business is so fast moving and it's also fairly complex. We have, um, when I first joined Axon in 2017, we were still technically called Taser. Uh, the company has changed pretty dramatically over the past few years. We now sell hardware and software and services. We sell book and chip, we sell subscriptions, we have bundles. We have fairly complex commercial offerings. And the, uh, the company is growing pretty quickly as well. We added over 600 employees last year, and we're looking to add even more this year. And with all the growth, um, you know, it, we're, it's also coming in different areas geographically. We're expanding our footprint beyond law enforcement into several different industries and markets. And, and geographically, we're getting a bigger presence internationally. And it's very, you know, we have real time, you know, we have real time visibility to our cash needs and where we need it in certain geographies because it's not as simple as you know wiring funds overnight to a certain country like there's there's a lot of work that goes into sometimes standing up a new entity uh you know if we need a, a new office in, in an area like what are the all the different hurdles we've got to jump through and so having someone that um a is forward thinking enough to be able to anticipate those needs but the technology is very important because you've got to understand very quickly uh you've got to have a great ability to to you've got to have visibility to your cash where it's flowing when you need it and how you could move it if you needed to. So the technology for us is, is critical. We're actually in the process right now of re-implementing our ERP. And this is one of the reasons for that is we're, we're bringing our, our, our treasury suite of software along with it. Now, Jawad, you've produced a book which is called What They Didn't Tell Me, which is very much around your journey to, to get to that CFO role um, and the learnings and, that you had along the way. Um, there's some really key points in there that I just wanted to pick up on too to start with, but surround yourself with quality people that, that will take you further than you think. Talk me a little bit about that as, as a topic, because that's something I really believe in. Yeah, I love talking about this. It's so critical. Um, I believe companies are nothing more than collections of people. 
And the quality of your people is directly going to dictate how successful your company is. And I have the luxury now of working in a role where I can hire people that, you know, there's this cliche, it's cliched, but it's true, you know, hire people that are smarter than you. And I can say that of all of my direct reports, my, my head of investor relations is the best in the world at what she does. Uh, the, or my controller is the best controller in the world. I can say that of everyone on my team, my head of FP&A, our treasurer is just fantastic. All of these people are better at what they do than I am. And I don't, I don't feel any sort of, you know, I'm not threatened by that at all. I, I'm just, I'm just, you know, it's, it's a luxury, quite frankly, to have a team that's so strong. Uh, and it's something that I look for. I, you know, I've, I've told my direct reports, if you guys ever get the opportunity to go be a CFO somewhere, you should entertain it, right? I hope you never leave. I, I think you're great at what you do and you make my job easier, but I also want what's best for you and, you know, for your careers. And I know it'd be pretty fantastic for yourselves and for your families if you were offered a CFO opportunity somewhere. And so I've told them, like, if you get that opportunity, let's talk about it. You don't have to interview behind my back or any of that. Like, you know, I'd like to support you in that. Um, and I think just having that open relationship with my team and letting them know I'm your biggest cheerleader. I want first and foremost, what's best for you and for your careers that pays itself forward. And they, you know, they treat their teams like that. And we have this tremendous atmosphere of trust here at Axon where we support each other. Uh, we have a, an organization that we call Top Gun that we've got the, the top folks, um, you know, within finance, legal, all, all people, you know, in my org that are very much invested in each other's development. We spend time sharing uh, articles and lessons with each other. And it's just, like I said, I spend two thirds of my time on people and the types of people that you surround yourself with are so important. But then again, once they're here, you've got to keep them engaged and you've got to really put the work in to make sure that you're developing them, that you're rewarding them or they're going it's to leave. It's a really interesting job that you say that because I have a theory that the best leaders out there and the, the best managers are people who care more about their people than themselves. And I think when you hear people, when I hear the people that I respect and I know that are very good talk the way you just have, they all tend to be really good leaders. And um, that's another point you make in your book that anyone can be a leader, but don't assume because you're in a leadership position that you are a leader. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, um, someone told me this fairly early in my career and it's only been with the passage of time that I've been in context, honest, but very early on, I was entering a, a training session for a, a program and they said, be a leader this week. I didn't really understand what they meant. And what I've understood now is that being a leader is a choice. You don't just get promoted into a role and then all of a sudden, you know, you're a leader. And, and, and that's really the difference between a leader that people want to follow uh, versus someone that they have to follow is if you view your role as a leader as, as more of like a responsibility that you're looking out for your people versus, okay, now I'm in this position of power and I'm going to bark out orders and people have to do what I say, you know, and it's also, I've also found it's generally the difference between someone who's a micromanager and someone who's not. Um, I think I have been micromanaged in my career. And I think that it's one of the most demoralizing things that can happen because everybody spends so much time investing in themselves, going to college, maybe getting a master's, you know, you, you look at the LinkedIn learning videos and you go on YouTube and you work on your executive presence. And, and now to have somebody come and tell you not only what they want you to do, but how they want you to do it, it's so demoralizing. So I like to give my teams very broad objectives and then let them go and figure out how to do it. And I try to tell my, my directs, like, do, this, do the same thing with your, you know, with your directs. It might be a little hard to let go sometimes and your, your folks might not do what you want them to do exactly the way that you would do it. And they might even fail, but that's okay because they're going to learn. And then it's the act of that, that failure that's going to make them stronger in the future. You know, I have the luxury of being able to do that because I'm not really, at this point in my career, I'm not chasing a promotion. I'm not looking to, you know, and, and I actually would argue, even if you are, even if you're in a position where you're, you still have some ways to go and you're looking for a promotion, um, Fixating on that promotion is the fastest way to ensure that you're not going to be focused on your people, right? And focusing on your people is oddly enough is that's what's going to set you apart as a leader. And that's what will ultimately get you that promotion. Totally agree. And, but I, I think the selflessness and you used another term that I use all the time and that's pay it forward. I just think if you do the right thing by other people, it, it comes back. It's, it's that karma type scenario, isn't it? That's right.
that that's a that's that's exactly right just putting that positive energy out there is very important the other thing you talk about in your book is hiring people you can trust no matter what it costs um i, I think trust and, and COVID in this environment that we've been in trust has become super important hasn't it talk us through that sure you know i talked earlier about those uncoachable traits and really collectively those four traits are a heuristic that i use for trust i know if someone has if someone has a strong sense of integrity and accountability, if they're a collaborative person and if they're a positive person, then, then I can trust them, okay? And that, that's so important because if I can trust you, then I don't need to worry about really managing you. And I think that's where you know you've made the right hire versus maybe not the right hire. If you're really actively managing somebody because they need to be managed, then you know either you're not, you haven't gotten alignment with that person and maybe you need to better communicate uh, your objectives and goals or maybe that person might not be suited for the role. And it's okay, like early on, if you're helping someone get up to speed, but if you find that you've got an employee that you're actively like helping manage their deliverables, like especially the higher up you go, you know, week in and week out, that's not, you know, maybe it's not the type of person that you can trust. And that's important because the higher up you go in the organization, the bigger your span becomes and you need to be focused on more strategic objectives. And you can't be worried about, is this person gonna follow up on, you know, what I asked them to do? Um, and so, you know, it just gets really important to, to be able to, to trust and, you know, moving at the speed of trust is another cliche, but it's, it's very much true. And the final point um, I just wanted to touch on, uh, Jawad, is you, you talk about defining your North Star. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I had um, probably the first eight or nine years of my career at GE, I just kept my head down and kept working hard and assumed that if I did a good enough job, I would get noticed and someone would tap me on the shoulder and bring me the next opportunity. And if it didn't happen to GE, then you know what, then maybe a recruiter or someone would, would find me and you know, I'd be fine. And I, I took a job at GE where I worked for someone, a, a former mentor of mine. And about a month after I got there, he left and took another job. And now I was at this division of GE where I had no network, I had no political capital. And it was sort of a soul searching moment. And what I realized was if I kept doing that, if I kept just waiting to get tapped on the shoulder, I would end up where other people wanted me to be. And so I stopped and took stock and said, where do I want to be? What do I want to do long term? What is my North Star? What am I driving towards? And what really excited me was the idea of running a business. Like ultimately, what, what I get fired up about is being an operator. And so I wanted to run a business. And the closest proxy for that was a, a CEO. So I worked backwards from there and said, well, for me, let me look up CEOs and uh, see how they got to where they did and if there's a way that I could possibly get there. And what I started noticing was there are folks that became CFOs and then made the leap over to CEO. And I said, well, I'm already in finance, so maybe I should rise to the top of my function. And I just kept working backwards from there. And I thought about being a CFO of a standalone company uh, and then first a divisional CFO. And that really dictated the course of my career from that point forward. Now, I wish I could tell you it worked out exactly as I had hoped. Like from that point forward, I actually went from that job to a divisional CFO, to a private equity CFO, and then a public company in my current job. And I wish I could tell you like it panned out exactly as I had, even though it did pan out like I envisioned, it was luck. It was a lot of it was luck. Um, and I'll tell you a quick anecdote. When I started at GE, I worked for GE Plastics. Uh, it's a division they no longer own in, in the leadership development program. And the CFO at the time, was Jeff Bornstein. Jeff ended up becoming the, C the CFO for all of GE until very recently. Okay, Jeff was a, a high flyer at GE for his entire career there. He met with the folks on this leadership program and he said something I'll never forget. He said with his own career, the, that 80% of what happened to him was luck and 20% of it was his own hard work. And he said, you know, that's why you've really got to work hard because only 20% of it is, is up to you and it is within your control. So you've got to work really hard to make sure you're prepared when opportunity does come knocking. And, and again, I've seen that bear out in my career. A lot of how I got to where I am now is serendipity, you know, and, and it's good fortune. Uh, but I made sure that when those opportunities came up that I was ready. I totally agree with that. And I get asked, I mean, as a recruiter, I get asked a lot, how do I get from, you know, from where I am to where I want to be? And you know, so it's just timing. It's timing and, and luck. You know, it's a lot of the time people want definitive answers when they're going through a recruitment process as to why they didn't get a job. And it's not that you couldn't do the job. It's just literally only one person gets chosen, right? And so you just have to be the one that they choose. And a lot of the time I see it with my clients where 
there's two or three people that they really like, which one do they choose? That really is just luck of the draw, isn't it? It's not something you can define or you couldn't have answered any questions any differently. It's just something that they had to make a choice. So I agree, luck is definitely a big part. That's so true, Simon. And it goes back to your earlier point about the karma. It's just, it's in your benefit to keep putting that positive energy out there because ultimately it's going to go your way. Absolutely. And yeah, don't, don't read too much into the fact that if you run second, you know, it, it's, there's no, it's not your shortfalls. It's just someone had to make a decision. That's, and, and that look, to be honest with you, Java, that's a lot of my podcast. And the reason I do this is I get to talk to great people like yourself, but everyone has a different story. And the fact that people hear that and realize that it is just a put yourself in the environment and luck will play out and you'll get the roles eventually. You know, like you say, you get to your North star eventually, but you may not be on the path that you first thought it was going to be. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, Jawad, it's been a pleasure chatting to you today. Thank you so much for your insights. We've got a lot of alignment in the way that we think. So uh, really appreciate it. I loved your book and thanks very much for coming on. Thanks again for having me, Simon.